Okay, so you won't have to mark it. Okay, so how, have you already had workshops in your last year? Yeah. Yes. 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 So you know your groups, basically. Yeah. Split, yeah. Do the same thing, okay? So half of you come in here next Monday, and the other half go to the Bragg Lecture Theatre, which is just over the road in this building, just over there. And then we'll have staff doing workshops again. You'll be all right. Yes. Yes. Um, bring, it's just a couple of formulas, yes. And doing the other diseases. So in Bragg. You could have been born in here and born in Bragg. It's going to be difficult. Right, the second apology is that screen there. I called the Visual Aids guy, and he's been here, and he's looked at it, and he said we might have to do with one screen today because I, I, I don't know what he's done anyway, but you might find periodically it will spring back to life. It's just a bit strange. So I think it's an easy problem. So, so I, now, the notes I've given you are comprehensive. Okay, so basically, we use this course for the industrial placement students. So I've given you their notes. Okay, so they have to do it without me, which probably means they'll get better marks. Okay, but, but the notes are, 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 so that's the total notes I'm going to give you. You're going to need for the course in that family account. So I put it on the, oh, it's come back. Yeah. Every now and again, it'll, it'll warm up a little bit. Okay, so, so those notes are everything you need. If you learn the notes and you can do the calculation, you should pass the exam, no problem. Um, for my workshops, you will need calculators. Okay, so when you come to the workshop, please, please bring your calculators. It's a bad idea to buy a calculator the night before an exam, because almost certainly you'll make mistakes, okay? So, so if you're going to buy a calculator, treat yourself to a calculator now, and use, then you sit in my workshop, and it'll be fine for the exams. I had a really weird experience once. I had two students who gave me the wrong answers, exactly the same wrong digits, but, come, you know, like to the fourth decimal place. And I couldn't understand how this could be. They were sitting in different seats. You'd, you'd swear if, if that they'd been copying, how could anybody do that? But what they'd done, they'd both gone and bought a new calculator the night before the exam. And it was a different system, log logic or Polish or something like that. And they both used the same keys as they used practice on their old calculator. And they'd both given me the same wrong answers, which is really, really weird. So, so basically, there will be calculations in my questions. You'll see from past papers what, what's the sort of thing I do. So you need to be proficient in that. They're not difficult. Crystallography isn't a difficult subject. It's very visual. It's very important. And it's something that you do need to understand. But it's not that difficult. Okay, so, so a lot of it is just straightforward mathematics. But you need to do it. Right. X-ray crystallography. It's, to me, probably, but I'm a crystallographer, it's probably one of the most important characterization techniques we've got. It's equivalent to picking up a molecule and looking at it. Okay, it's as straightforward as that. And the reason it's evolved is because you might know that if you want to see smaller and smaller things, you will hit a, a, a limit uh, as far as the wavelength of the light is concerned. You won't be able to resolve detail below a certain wavelength. Uh, and the conclusion would be that you need to go to very short wavelengths to see atomic resolution, hence x-rays. But really, you then hit another problem. You can't bend x-rays like you can ordinary light with lenses. So you then need to come to, the, to, to diffraction and x-ray crystallography, which then eventually gives you the same thing as you would with a microscope and a lens. So effectively, we're actually looking at molecules, and we're looking at them at a high accuracy. Right, I'll take you through this. So my course is basically x-ray crystallography. Okay, we use two main structural characterization techniques, structural characterization techniques. Now you've done the spectroscopy. Um, the way things work at universities, we tend to overemphasize spectroscopy because you can interact with it, really, much more so than you can do with crystallography. You have to solve problems. You, 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 how many peaks are there in the NMR? What's the, what's the coupling and so on? So it's something you can do as, as a problem. Now, you can't really do the same thing with crystallography. It either gives you the answer or it doesn't. Okay, so if, if you put a crystal on a diffractometer, it will give you the full structure. 
and you don't have to say, oh, what's the confirmation of this? You, you actually see it in front of you. So we tend to sort of do things which you can interact with and learn uh, and, and gain uh, skills in. But really, we would, as a crystallography, we would call these the sporting methods. Okay, because it means that there's a slight chance you wouldn't be able to characterize the material. Whereas with crystallography, it's absolutely guaranteed that if you've got a crystal, we can actually give you the full structure, including conformation, including chemical composition, and including intermolecular interactions. Okay, so you get everything from crystallography. So you do tend to possibly overemphasize. You might sort of leave university thinking, well, this is the way we characterize things. Well, yeah, to a certain limit, but in fact, the full characterization, those things you see in your textbooks and so on, will have come from X-ray crystallography. Right, diffraction. Spectroscopy relies on energy levels within molecules, how, how electrons leak between energy levels, how vibrational state change between energy levels. Whereas in diffraction, we don't need an energy level within the molecule. We just want the light to be scattered. So in, in this image I've got here, it's actually water waves. So there's a, there's a, in a water tank, we've got a nice planar wave coming in here. They're striking a barrier. And then there's a couple uh, uh, of holes in the barrier, so the waves carry on going through the holes. And as you can see, there's regions here now where the waves strengthen to give you something you can see as a dark wave up and down there. But there's also regions where there's nothing. Okay, so there's calm there. So if you were somebody in a boat and this was a harbour and the waves are striking the edge of a harbour, you could actually row your little boat out there and you find it as still as a mill pond. Okay, there, there wouldn't be any problems there, there would be absolutely have no waves at all. Whereas here, the waves would be colossal, the blues would be much larger here. So we get these, because they're waves, you get regions where they reinforce to give you higher intensity, and we get regions where they cancel out, they would be, let's say, waves, to give you no wave intensity. So both those occur inside diffraction, and we can have in between as well. So this is a property of waves, diffraction is a property of waves. So if we turn to light, light waves, we get the same thing. So instead of having water striking a harbour wall, as it were, we could have light stri striking a barrier with holes in it, so a series of holes in this side. If you put, the more holes you get, the sharper the diffraction image. So if we shine light on a series of holes like that, we'd end up with a pattern of light and dark like that. And what's happening is that if we go traverse from this hole to that hole, we end up with regions of dark and light as we had against the barrier wall in the water tank. We've got no condition in this direction yet. Okay, we're not sort of imposing any condition in that direction, but in the direction of the holes, we've got regions where we're going to strengthen, the waves are going to combine to give us more intense waves, and we've got we have regions where the waves cancel out completely. So effectively, we're imposing on the light hitting this barrier conditions that it won't give any intensity between these regions here. So we, we're saying that if it was just one hole there, for example, we'd probably end up with a blob of diffuse light here. But with, with, with these holes, we actually said, look, light can't go there, can't go there, can't go there. And it's perpendicular to the direction of the holes like that. If we turn the holes around, and shine light, and we end up, of course, there's no restriction in this direction now. But there is a restriction here where the waves can reinforce and cancel out. So we end up with waves can't give any intensity because they cancel out. They give us maximum intensity there, they cancel out there, and so on. <coughs> so the waves give us regions of darkness. What happens if we put a square array of holes? Well, obviously, we're going to impose conditions in two directions now. There's going to be dark and light in this direction, and there's going to be dark and light in that direction. So effectively, we've reduced the amount of light that can through now. Even though we've made more holes, there's less regions where we're going to have light now, because we've sort of said, look, previously, in this one, we had a whole streak there where there was, we could have light. Now we're saying, because we put a second condition in this direction, even though we've got more holes, we're actually reducing the regions where we've got light. So, so the waves cancelling out is now putting a tighter constraint on where we can see light in this two-dimensional <coughs> diffraction pattern. What happens 
if you go in three dimensions. A crystal is actually a three-dimensional <coughs> diffraction rate, if you think about it, it repeats in three dimensions. Okay, that's something I did when I was a student, I think. And basically, it's a piece of photographic film. Uh, what you see there is called a beam stop. It stops the, stops the extras making a big black blob in the middle of my film. And what you see there is the diffraction pattern from a crystal. And as you can see, there are great similarities between what we saw there for ordinary light and holes of ordinary dimensions and microscopic three dimension crystal repeats. And x rays, we can see the regions of light and dark going across the film. <coughs> The thing, the difference is that I have led you to believe that if I went from one dimensional to two dimensional to three dimensional, I should have less regions of where I could have light. And that is true actually. I cheated to get this picture here. If I had just done the same as I did for the gratings I showed you before, I would probably have one spot there, maybe one spot there, something like that. But what's happening is the crystal is actually being rotated. Okay, and, and what happens then is you bring the various holes or, or repeats into the diffracting position. So this only happens if you actually move the, condi the crystal out. So the conditions for diffractions are more stringent for three dimensions than they are for two dimensions. But if you move the crystal around, what will happen is that the, the, you will get a diffraction uh, condition satisfied for the three directions at one position and it will then shine off to like a, a, a lighthouse in that direction and then it will rotate and another one will come over there and another one there and another one there and gradually it will build up the whole pattern. So the whole pattern is something that has built up over time, not a huge amount of time, it would have taken about 10 minutes to gather that information. But it is something that is inherent in X-ray diffraction, that when you're dealing with three dimensions you have to actually move the crystals in some way to get the diffraction pattern. So my work is to do with measuring those patterns. I don't have to use films anymore. We've, got, we've gone over to digital cameras and we've gone over to CCD detectors in our diffractometers. So we don't need to use films anymore. We can measure those patterns in seconds now. But the, uh, what we do do is, we, we, if you remember when I started off, I said what we'd really like to do is to be able to magnify the, what's inside the crystal so we can see the molecules. Uh, and what we can do is, if we measure those patterns, although we can't actually bend the X-rays, remember the X-rays are too hard to be bent by a lens, but if we record those patterns, we have computer software that imitates a lens. Okay? So we will then bring all those scattered <coughs> intensities back together if we measure them, and bring them back together, as a lens would bring them back together and give us an exact image of what's inside the crystal. We'll see the molecule, its conformation, the type of atoms, and the bond lengths to the third or fourth decimal place quite easily. Okay, so it's a very, very precise, but also a very photogenic technique as well. But what I'm going to do next is I'm going to actually take you through the terms in crystallography that we need as chemists. Okay, so if you look at a lot of chemical papers, you'll see that the absolute proof of what you make, whether you've made a drug, or a new molecular magnet and so on, will be an X-ray crystallographic determination. And in, along with those, there will be a certain number of terms. They're not difficult terms, they're just crystallographic terms that give you the information about the structure. So what I'm going to do for the rest of this lecture is to take you through some crystallographic terms, which you probably have met some of them before. <clears throat> if we take any crystal, and if we could magnify it, we'd find we could go down in the same way as if, you know, when you're sitting in the dentist waiting to go in and you're looking at the wallpaper really bored there, you can usually find a little repeat, middle be a rose or something like that, that you can repeat to give the full pattern. Okay, it's the same in crystals, okay? If we go zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, eventually, it's not like Google Earth where you see all kinds of different things, okay? Eventually, what you'll see is something repeating and repeating and repeating in the three dimensions. And the smallest repeat, will be uh, in a three dimensions it will be in itself. It's, if you look at wallpapers, it'll be a two dimensional, but in three dimensions, it'll be an in itself. And the convention is, the size of the in itself will be A, B, and C, and the angles between the sides will be alpha, 
beta and gamma. Okay, and you'll see this reported in, a, in when we report a crystal structure. We don't just give you the bond length and angles, we'll give you the details which will enable you to calculate other things you need as well. So we always report it using the unit cell, the symmetry of the unit cell, and the, the positions of the atoms within the unit cell. So the unit cell is quite an important thing for crystallography. The alpha is between B and C. The gamma, which is Greek for C, is between A and uh, B, and uh, the uh, beta is between C and A. So it's, it's quite logical how we've done it. Okay, so um, in this case, this is the most general one I've got. Okay, so the, the angles, none of the angles are 90 degrees, and none of the sides are equal to one another. For reasons, basically, of symmetry, we, we um, divide the in, in its cells. I'm not going to ask you a question, in case you're panicking, I'm going to have to learn all this. It's something, actually, if you start reading chemical papers, you'll see these cropping up and you will learn them naturally. So I'm not going to ask you in the exam, what system has no angles on 90 degrees and all the angles sides are different? Okay? I'm not going to ask you that. But I'm just saying for you to be aware there are these systems and the reason why we've got them. And it's not for like we're collecting stamps or anything like that. The reason really is to do with the symmetry that these if you want, boxes will hold. Okay, so the only cell, you can think about it as a box that will hold your atoms and molecules. That box could have a certain symmetry. So you could pack <laughs> things in a symmetric manner, or, 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 um, or you could pack something in a non-symmetric manner. So the, you might have quite a large unicell, which has got a lot of symmetry, for example, a cubic. And you'll find that as a crystallographer, you'll find that the part you work with is tiny, because the crystal system has got so much symmetry, it will generate the full system using symmetry. Whereas, if you go to a tribe clinic, um, we'll find that there's hardly any symmetry at all there. The, the highest symmetry you can get that. There's no rotation axes you can get in tri clinic. But you could have a new sensor inversion. Why can't you have, I can hear you say, a rotation axis, a twofold axis or something in tri clinic? Well, if you go back to the unit cell, what you'd have to be able to do is you'd have to be able to rotate the cell around and make it look the same. Okay, so if you can't rotate the cell and have the cell look the same as when you did the rotation, it wouldn't it wouldn't actually hold that symmetry. The symmetry operation is part and parcel of the cell if you if you think about it. So I couldn't have a twofold rotation in that because if I rotated that around, I would find that the cell would be pointing in a different direction. The only operation I can't have is an, is a point of inversion in the middle. So, the, the, so, the, so there isn't much symmetry when you've got all the sides are, are different and all the angles are different. But as you get a more symmetric system, monoclinic or thrombic, tetragonal, the sides become equal. And then you can have things like fourfold symmetry and so on. And what that means is that the cell will hold that symmetry and usually you'll find that the, the, the molecules are packed in a very symmetric way. Again, along the same lines, you'll find that we specify whether the system is centered or not. P is for primitive, C is um, the AB face is centered, I is body centered, F is face centered. Well, you might, sort of, it might occur to you then, why bother? Why not just work? with the smallest cell possible, because what you're doing effectively, if you make something C-centered, um, instead of keeping the smaller primitive cell, is you're doubling the volume. You need doubling your work, you might think. Okay, so, so I have to work with what's inside the cell as a crystallographer. So the smaller the part I have to work with, the less work it is. So you might say, well, isn't this stupid? Why not just work with something, the smallest volume you can have? You don't need to make it into these fancy centered cells. Well, what you find is that if you go, for example, to body center in the cubic, whereas rather than choose the body center, you might choose the corner of the cell, which was primitive, you'll find that you lose all the symmetry. So by going to these centered cells, you will be introducing angles in 90 degrees will be introducing equal science and so on. So, so although it sounds a bit mad that you have centered cell, in fact, it actually, you gain more than you lose because you're actually introducing more symmetry to the system. 
I have to point out that it isn't my choice, by the way, or, or that any crystallographer's choice what the symmetry of the system is. The system is got whatever symmetry. I'm making it sound like I'm going to choose its C, I'm going to choose its P, and so on. The system will have what it has. I just measure what it's got. Okay? But then I've got to deal with the consequences, and I've actually got to work and refine the structure in whatever system you've got. So, yeah, but it's something that's imposed by the crystal system and the structure rather than something that I choose. Okay, so those are the unit cells. The next bit I'd like to talk to you about are fractional atomic coordinates. So the unit cell, if you want, is the box which your contents will come in, which will be the atoms and molecules. How do we specify the position of the atoms in the unit cell? Well, we give them fractional coordinates. Now, the important thing is that they are relative to the unit cell. They're not in, a, in millimeters or angstroms or anything else. These are actually fractions of the unit cell. So you'll see that every atom we determine in a crystal structure will have fractional coordinates. It'll be, for example, I've given you an example here. X is equal to 0.123. Y is equal to 0.456. Z equal to 0.789. That would be absolutely meaningless without an unit cell. Okay, it, it means nothing. Okay, so what it, with an unit cell, you can actually put the atom in its position. So it's point one, two, three times the cell side A, down A. That is point four, five, six times the cell side B. But I usually use angstroms, by the way. So if, if it was eight angstroms, it would be point four, five, six times eight angstroms, but down the B direction. If it's a 90 degree system, it would be orthogonal. If it's triclinic, it would be parallel to the B side in triclinic. Um, Z would be 0.789 in my example there, times C, the C direction, but in the direction of C as well. So, so this information will allow you to pinpoint an atom within, within the unit itself. Okay, you can position the atom there. And each atom in the crystal structure will have its own fractional coordinates you'll know the unit cell. So you can position the atom and you can build up the molecule. I'm going to show you how to do these using calculators and so on, but in fact, um, we've got lots of software. We'll take the fractional coordinates. They're stored in a big, big crystallographic database. You can download them, and we've got free software that will draw them wonderfully for you. So every crystal structure <coughs> we publish will be available to you in some form. But that's how we specify the fractional coordinates relative to the unit cell. Along with the fractional coordinate, we do actually, the, the data is sufficient, of sufficient quality normally, for us to actually determine the vibration of the atoms. Um, we call them atomic displacements as well. Because, strictly speaking, there might not be vibrations. We could have an atom which has two positions within the unit cell. And so we would get two, if you want, displaced positions. But generally speaking, it will be because the atoms are vibrating. And as I said, the data we get off the diffractometers these days is sufficient, of sufficient quality for us to easily determine the atomic vibrations. Okay, so, so we will report each atom in terms of fractional coordinates, x, y, z, and also vibration parameters as well to describe how much the atom is vibrating. And if you determine the structure at low temperature and compare it with the same structure at room temperature, you'll find the vibrations will get less as you cool it back. Asymmetric units. What I like are asymmetric <coughs> units because that's what you deal with as a crystallography. You deal with asymmetric units. Usually it's one molecule. It doesn't have to be one molecule. The molecule itself could have crystallographic symmetry. It could have a mirror. It could have a rotation axis. So the molecule, if the molecule, for example, a very common example would be uh, an, um, an octahedral molecule could have an inversion center in the middle. You know, you could have that symmetry. And it, if that was a, a crystallographic symmetry, you'd only put half the molecule in, and then the other half would be generated through the inversion point. Okay, so, so, you, so, but usually, in most cases, it's one molecule. Sometimes it, it's part of a molecule. Sometimes it's two, three or four, depending on the packing. Okay, but usually it's one molecule, and that's what you deal with. This is the part that, if you think about it, 
It fits into the unit cell via the fractional coordinates. I will talk to you in a second about the symmetry, the centric we've already mentioned. But there will be other symmetry operations, which will then be applied to this asymmetric unit to fill the unit cell. And then the unit cell is repeated in the three directions to give you the macroscopic crystal which we can see. This is a strange thing. You'd think, in order to describe the molecule, I've given you everything you need now. You don't need anything else. However, because of somebody over there, Brad, he decided to describe crystal diffraction of crystals as reflections. Um, you've seen already that it is quite a difficult thing to visualize when you go from one dimension to two dimensions to three dimensions. You've effectively got to have three diffraction conditions satisfied at the same time. So what Brad was rather clever, he remember he was living 100 years ago, before we had all these computers we have now. We might do it differently if we started now. But it's a testimony to how effective his visualization has been. Is that what we use now, still? So in order for that to work, what he did was, he said, rather than treat it as three dimensions like this, let's treat it as a plane. Let's cover two dimensions as a plane, and then think of it as reflecting off those planes. But they're special planes. They're planes, if we determine the distance between the planes, the, we will get reinforcement and cancellation depending on the distance between the planes. And this is what he did. But in order for that to work, we need to be able to define planes as well. So we don't need it to define to describe a crystal or the atoms or something, but we do need it in order to do X-ray diffraction. And the way of describing the planes is using Miller indices. And I've given you how it's done there. It, it seems a bit weird, actually, in, you know, the way it's been done. But it does have huge advantages. Notice A, B, and C, relative to A, B, and C again. The Miller indices is, for example, if I've got a Miller index of 2, 3, 4, Okay? What it means is that it intercepts side A at A over 2. It intercepts side B at B over 3. And it intercepts C at C over 3. So, so if I give you a middle index of 2, that's for two, two, um, sorry, um, C over 4. So if I give you 2, 3, 4, it intercepts A at A over 2, B at B over 3, and C at C over 4. So those are the intercepts. Okay, so this, it seems a bit strange, in fact, the fact that they're one over the value you give. It actually is quite beneficial in terms of calculations. It makes the calculations very straightforward. And again, this grew up from looking at um, crystals before the days of x-rays, when people were just looking at the angles of crystal faces. Okay, so, but it has worked out quite well, even though it seems a bit of a strange way to define crystal faces. So Miller indices, H, K, and L. Right, here's the Bragg equation. There's the Bragg equation at the bottom. Lambda, that is the wavelength of the x-rays, is equal to 2 d, the distance between the planes, times sine theta, where, where theta is the angle of diffraction. I've got a construction to show you now. Okay, so this just goes with a construction. I'll just flip straight over to that. Now, I'm not going to ask you to be able to do, determine every equation. I, I will expect you to be able to do this from scratch if I ask you. Now, you don't have to draw the wavy lines. Okay, they're just to help you visualize what's, what's happening. Okay, if, if they do at all, I don't know. I, so if, if I ever ask you to, to determine this, don't feel you've got to draw those wiggly lines. Okay, just leave them off. And effectively, what we're saying is we've got two parallel rays coming here, one's being reflected off the top plane, and the second one is going straight through. Remember this is a crystal now with repeated planes going right through the crystal. In the same way as the cell is repeated, the planes will be repeated mm -hmm. right through the crystal. So if we've got a separation of D between the planes, one of the <laughs> rays will bounce off the top plane, but the other one will have to travel a further distance. Okay, so the, the, the bottom plane is a distance of d away. So effectively, it will have to travel along the path. And if you remember, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about interference of waves. 
If both waves are in phase, we will get maximum intensity. But as they slip out of phase, we will eventually end up with a position where they could cancel out, give you no intensity at all. So we're looking for positions where the waves will reinforce with a crest, uh, and coincide exactly with a crest. That is the only position that will give you any reflection or diffraction. The reason for that is because we're repeating things, okay, D, 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 all the way down. So it isn't a case of just one slit, it's actually lots and lots and lots of slits, like a diffraction grating if you've used those in physics. Okay, so, so all we've got to do is determine the extra distance the bottom wave travels, okay? And, the, and this is, ignore the wavy bits, just look at these lines here. So if we take the top rater there, what we need to do then is to draw a line to the bottom one at right angle. So that's an angle of 90 degrees there. So we're cutting both of them. So up to that point, both rays have traveled the same distance. If, I, if that's 90 degrees there, okay? 90 degrees, 90 degrees. Both rays have traveled the same up to that point. If we take it beyond there, again, after that, they're traveling at the same, the parallels of another. So the extra bit is this bit here, at the bottom. Okay, so all we need to do that is to, there's the angle of reflection, theta, theta on either side, of course. If we now say, okay, then we can, because these are parallel, remember, we can put theta there as well. And this is an angle of 90 degrees here. Therefore, that will be 90 minus theta there, and therefore that will be theta at the top of that. Simple geometry. So if we want to determine what that extra bit there is, it's D sine theta. Okay, so that extra bit there is D sine theta there. And then, if we go to the other side, it's actually symmetric, but you can do it again to the side if we wish, okay? But that bit also, that extra bit there is also D sine theta down there. That being the case, the extra path travel will be not D sine theta, but 2 D sine theta. Okay? Because we've already started travel there and there. So what does that have to be equal to? It has to go to be equal to a whole number of wavelengths. Okay, so if we if we were completely in phase, which they won't do, because one hundred travel a number of distances, <coughs> the, the wavelength number would be zero. But if it was equal to lambda, we would get them reinforced, reinforcing. So if that distance from there to there is a whole wavelength, they will be back in phase by the time they get into that position there. So n lambda, if you wish number of wavelengths is equal to 2d sine theta and that's the Bragg law. If you have a look at it, sorry about that, if you have a look at it you'll find that uh, it's relatively straightforward. Try not to get distracted too much by these wavy bits. If you've got to reproduce it ever, don't bother with the wavy bits. Just draw, do this construction. Try it a few times, you'll find it works. It's the fundamental equation of X-ray crystallography. Another fundamental one is we want now to relate that D. Okay, it's just I'm just visualizing planes running through the crystal. Really, I don't want to disembody the planes. I want them to be related to my human itself. So this is a simplified version of relating D to A and B and by extrapolation to C as well. So I'm using an orthogonal system. And again, I do expect you to be able to reproduce this if I ask you. So this is the way we relate the, the interplanar spacing to the initial dimension and the Miller indices. And it's all in this construction here. Okay, so rather than a plane, I've got a line, but you've got to pretend it's a plane coming out of the board or something like that. Okay, so the Miller indices x for H means that it intersects A at A over H. The K Miller index means it intercepts B at B over K. So that's quite a general Miller, in, um, Miller index. I, I'm not bothered with C or, uh, and L because I've got to do that by extrapolation. Okay, so the plane, the interplanar spacing will be this perpendicular here. So it's at right angles 
to this line or plane. So I need to now, so as it says, it's a pure construction. But what I do, I, I pick an angle. Okay, I, I call it phi. You can call it dots or anything you want. Okay, and if I put call that angle phi there, phi there, it will also be phi over there as well. Okay, so that'll be 90 minus phi, and therefore that will be phi over there. Okay, so we can then say that d is equal to b over k times cos phi. We can also say that d is equal to a over h times sine phi. Okay, so, so we've got these sort of, we can calculate d either from b over k or from a over h. Where does this take us? If we rearrange, so we could then get just the cos phi and sine phi terms, as I've done there. So sine phi, okay, I've just rearranged, which I've just determined now, okay? So sine phi is equal to dh over a, and then rearranging the other one, cos phi is equal to dk over b. We know that sine squared phi, or, or any angles, the same angle twice will give us one. So sine squared phi plus cos squared phi, it doesn't matter if it's phi or dot or anything, it's always equal to one. Okay, so sine squared phi plus cos squared phi equal to one. So if we square that and that together, we can say it's equal to one, which is what I've done there. So d squared a squared over a, a squared and plus d squared k squared over b squared is equal to one. Or rearranging it, h squared over a squared plus k squared over b squared is equal to one. Over b. <coughs> As I said, I, I'm, I'm extrapolating. Then I'm saying it's a, it's, a, it's an orthogonal system. If it was a plane, and it is true, you can say that h squared over a squared plus k squared over b squared plus l squared over c squared is equal to one over d squared. So we can now relate the d spacing of the bra plane to the unit cell, A, B, and C, and also the Miller index, H, K, L. So we could substitute whatever Miller index we had. It could be 1, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 1, or whatever. Each one would actually allow us to calculate the D spacing. And then once we've got the D spacing, we could then substitute that into the bra <coughs> equation, and we could get the theta value, so which we could then read off the diffraction pattern, if we wished. Right. I've gone helpful ever. So you've got, that's all I want to say today about this. Mm -hmm. Next week.